it's time for another Dan Southern Africa webinar. Uh, welcome to everybody. For those that don't know me, my name is Mornay Christo. I'm the host this evening, and I'm also the Dan Southern Africa CEO. Thank you for joining the webinar. I know that your time is valuable, and therefore I hope that you'll find the webinar informative and useful at the end of the day. I also trust that you're doing well and that you're safe and healthy. Uh, the talk topic this evening, avoid getting lost at sea. Um, basic uh, uh, webinar housekeeping rules. You'll find that you're muted and that your videos are turned off for the webinar. And uh, please use the chat box to introduce yourself and tell us where you are in the world and let us know what your expectations are for the webinar. Now, during the presentation, please use the Q&A box to ask questions and not the chat box so that um, you know, we don't lose track of, of the questions being asked. And the uh, webinar replay will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube and Facebook channel. So keep a lookout for that. Now, also remember to stick around till the end of the webinar. We'll have another lucky draw. And this evening, we got a couple of special prizes. Now, the special guests before the uh, formal um, webinar kickstart uh, are Julia and Miguel from 50 Bar Scuba Design. Now, Julia and Miguel recently uh, designed a, a range of new Dan t-shirts for, uh, for us. And today we, uh, they'll show us how they sort of approach their designs and uh, you know, we'll get a sneak peek of what it looks like. In fact, you can see I'm wearing one of them. Uh, and they'll also tell us a little bit about the services that they offer and some of the campaigns that they are running. Now, Brief 50 Bar Scuba Design is a design and marketing company inspired by the ocean uh, that provides a service to divers. So the Lucky Draw prizes, we'll have two um, uh, men's uh, t-shirts up for grabs. And in fact, there'll be the octopus design that you can see here. And we'll also have two ladies t-shirts up for grabs. So uh, remember to stick around for that. So the folks that have joined us via the uh, Facebook live stream, nice to have you on board. Um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, you can uh, ask them and just put them in the uh, chat box. I'll uh, keep track of those. And you're also welcome to introduce yourself and tell us where you are in the world and um, yeah, what your expectations are. So over to um, uh, the guest speakers this evening, we've got Brett and Nessa. Now Nessa Malone is uh, the product manager for Safe Tracks, uh, the vessel registration tracking and alerting platform. As a product manager, Nessa collaborates closely with multiple SAR professionals, coast guards, and the water sports community to shape and drive the future technical and operational roadmap of Safe Tracks uh, software suite. Now, Brett Ayers is the Rescue Services Director of the NSRI, responsible for ensuring that the NSRI is effective in responding to emergencies around the NSRI coast. This includes the effective uh, sighting, equipping and training of volunteer-led rescue uh, response and building and implementing effective rescue uh, networks to save lives. So important stuff that both Ness and, and Brett are involved with. Now, just the overall uh, overview of the uh, talk this evening is avoid getting lost at sea. And the webinar will focus on how Sea Rescue South Africa or the NSRI partners with SafeTrack to assist in emergency situations. Uh, SafeTrack is designed in uh, close cooperation with the police, uh, Coast Guard, marine rescue professionals from across the globe. And uh, Safe Tracks has become the leading maritime non GMDSS uh, safety system. It gives national SAR authorities a simple means of tracking and assisting inshore boat users using cellular technology. And uh, Safe Tracks is extremely instrumental in taking the search out of search and uh, rescue and is a major tool in ensuring that uh, rescues happen effectively and that lives are saved. So, this is amazing. I'm really looking forward to the talk. And um, especially for the folks from South Africa and beyond, um, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of value in this talk. For now, I'm going to hand over to Julia and Miguel uh, just to give us a brief introduction on their uh, designs of the shirts and uh, what they do with 50 Bar Scuba. This will just be a quick introduction. And at the end, uh, they'll also sort of close off. And after that, uh, they'll hand over to Brett and Nessa, who will officially kickstart the webinar. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. And uh, that's it from our side. Over to you, uh, Julia uh, and Miguel. Okay, 
right, guys. Well, um, yeah, thanks a lot for the time, Monet, and, and you know, for, for letting us join this, this, uh, this webinar. It's absolutely fantastic what you guys are doing out here and what you've been doing um, you know, since, since you guys have been around. Um, I basically want to really quickly go through you know, what, what we are, what we do, um, who we are, et cetera. Um, for any of you who have never really heard of us, uh, we're basically uh, 50 bar scuba design, uh, inspired by the ocean, yes. Um, what we literally do is uh, we provide design and marketing services to you know, dive centers and ocean-related uh, brands around the world. Um, I guess our underlying goal is, is you know, to, uh, through our support and through our services, um, with the final, you know, we want to sort of achieve a final result of you know, helping ocean conservation. Um, we basically do this by you know, applying our services and trying to, to update and rethink how scuba diving is sold and how it's portrayed by you know, future students who are obviously at the end become uh, ocean advocates. Um, what we generally do, you know, what, what kind of like separates us or differentiates us from, from other design studios, um, I think the, the most important part uh, would be that we're all um, instructors and uh, dive center managers. So we do have uh, an extensive knowledge, not only in teaching and, you know, in, in the actual sort of teaching system, um, but also from a business perspective. Um, what's great about this is that, you know, uh, our clients don't really necessarily need to, you know, explain what a DSD is or what an open water course is or, you know, the system and how it works. Um, we pretty much have been there ourselves. Uh, apart from that as well, um, we also, before we all became, you know, working uh, in the actual diving industry, um, we had a, uh, uh, we used to work in advertising and design studios. So we do have um, a lot of, uh, you know, a strong background in advertising, design, and so on and so forth. And all these things that we have literally learned, um, we have pretty much implemented um, in 50 Bar and in our clients as well. Um, another interesting part is that, um, especially before the pandemic, um, we were also available to work on site, which I thought was, uh, was very interesting because we could get a very, uh, you know, hands-on experience of, of our client and, our, and the operation we'd be working for. Um, and now, obviously, due to the pandemic, we're all still working uh, most of the time online, uh, which works fine thanks uh, to you know the whole uh, Wi-Fi system that we all have around the world. Um, as well, you know, due to the pandemic, as well, we understand that some dive businesses have been hit quite hard, um, and we understand that um, you know we have to we have to sort of manage as best as possible. So, what I think is interesting to point out as well that we do have um, some great deals and some sort of packages. That at the end, what we're trying to do here is, you know, help the whole industry out a bit. And at the end, you know, with that final goal of, of creating more ocean advocates. Um, we can sum up what we do and just so sort we of can really sort of get into the details or the basics. Um, um, basically, in these six points, uh, we basically specialize in logo design and branding. Um, we'll basically, you know, Create not only the logo, but you know the whole image assigned to the logo, the tone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can later uh, adapt that to uh, a web design where we can develop that, uh, and also print design. So anything that does need to get printed, uh, such as T-shirts, banners, whatever, um, will basically you know be on top and make sure it gets printed. And also just so we can try and reach out to as many people as possible out there online. Uh, we have, uh, we can create marketing and communication strategies um, and obviously implement these strategies into social media advertising campaigns. Um, so basically we can try and, you know, get, get, catch as, as many people as possible and at least, yeah, get, get everybody's attention. I know as well, obviously we, we like to uh, create a nice um, impact from the shop front as well. So for all the potential walk-in customers where we basically can also take care of, you know, decorations, murals, um, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Um, if, no, if, if you guys out there haven't really seen what we've done, I mean, we're gonna quickly go through some of our, um, our, our work. Um, this is basically or one of our projects for Uber Scuba, Indonesia, Komodo, um, Southeast Asia, fantastic dive location, I must say where we uh, basically help them, you know, launch their, their dive center, um, where we gave them a full sort of branding, uh, the print design with t-shirts, um, all these different um, materials from uh, dive site maps, log books, et cetera, et cetera. Very clear um, branding design for them to stand out from their competition. Um, 
Also, uh, we all have launched or relaunched Bayou Dive Center. This is in uh, Pulau Tioman, Malaysia. Um, this is uh, one of our favorite pieces from the relaunch, which is the uh, topographic map, uh, which is also a fantastic backdrop, for example, for students. Um, we also did the branding and ID for um, uh, biodiversity in Indonesia, Raja Ampat, fantastic little place. Um, I believe they're opening now soon. Um, and we also relaunched a uh, uh, Black Tip Scuba, uh, fantastic little dive center in Koh Phi Thailand uh, with their own little sort of campaign for this season with, uh, you know, there's whole equipment and um, mural decoration, a variety of pieces, um, literally just to help sort of give a very nice solid image um, to potential guests online and uh, offline who are basically walk-in customers. Um, maybe some of you have already heard of us as well through our um, free COVID awareness campaign, um, just so that everybody is aware. It is downloadable from our website still. Um, what we basically have done here is by, you know, um, taking Dan's advice, which they've done a fantastic job, I must say. Um, we've basically taken all their information and created a series of uh, downloadable posters and signs uh, to help basically communicate the efforts that you know you as a dive center um, are doing to help uh, mitigate the risk of infection. Um, there's a series of posters there, obviously downloadable. Um, and if you guys need to resize them or anything like that, well, we're always available as well. All right. Um, this is pretty much you know who we are, what we do, what kind of makes us different. Um, uh, we'll basically continue later on with the um, the rest of the uh, the presentation. We'll show you guys what we've been doing doing for um, for Dan, a bit of how we we created it and the process. Um, but up to now, it's uh it's up to you guys, uh, Ness and Brett. We can take off from there. Thank you very much, Miguel. No problem. Good. Okay, good. Um, there you go. Yeah, all yours. Fantastic. Morning. Good to go. Yeah, good to go. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Miguel, thank you for that. And uh, over to the uh, uh, the main presentation. Great stuff. Good, good. Um, yeah, so firstly, thanks to everyone for joining in tonight, for listening to us. Um, and thanks, Monet, for the opportunity to talk about uh, NSRI and Safe Tracks and, and hopefully illuminate a little bit of what it's about and, and what we do and, and the partnership we have. Um, so I think, I think hopefully most people who are sort of part of the conversation tonight will be aware that you know, the National Sea Rescue Institute is, is a nonprofit organization. A lot of people sometimes confuse us with a government organization or sort of some sort of part of the state. And that's absolutely not the case. We're, we're a nonprofit organization totally funded by, by individual donors. And basically, uh, since 1967, or, around the South African coast, um, our mission has been to save lives on South African waters. And we, the entire rescue effort is, is volunteer manned. So we have 1,400 volunteers at a 41 rescue bases around the South African coast and on inland dams. Um, and you know, we, we focus, historically, our, our focus has been sort of rescue based. So when people get into trouble to go to respond and rescue them. Um, and more recently, you know, in recent years, we've started to have a lot more of a preventative focus to, to prevent people getting into trouble you know, before they do so. Yeah, and part of that has been strong advocacy and lobbying just to make sure people are aware of, of the ocean. I think everyone who's part of this, the seminar tonight, or, or the webinar at least, as, at least is, is a passionate water sports user. Um, you're divers, you love the ocean, you love exploring, you love the adventure that, that can be had. And I think part of that adventure is, is to go into a wilderness environment, which is, which is the ocean, that's what the ocean is, um, and to enjoy what, what nature and what the ocean gives to you. And I think the sea is a whole lot of fun, but it's also a whole lot of danger. And I think just the, the sheer number of incidents, and I think Monet and Dan you know, will be able to attest to the number of incidents that, that happen. And a lot of those are preventable. Um, and you know, having been a dive industry professional myself, you, know, you can put the best planning and prevention, but there are days that the, the sea will get ahead of you. Um, and despite whatever prevention you put in place, there's going to be a need for, for a rescue. There's also a reason why SAR, uh, search and rescue, sort of is put together as one package. <laughs> there's always a search first, and then there's a rescue second. And I think five years ago, Safe Tracks and Sea Rescue sort of met, and, and you know, they had a really, really good concept, which they were developing with a whole lot of maritime organizations and, and rescue services around the world where essentially their mandate was to take the search out of search and rescue. Um, 
And the, the philosophy behind that was, well, if you knew where water users were, um, if you have a very accurate location, you don't have to spend hours and minutes, you know, doing uh, often in a rescue capacity, fruitless searches for things that you cannot find in a very vast ocean, but you can go straight to the person, to the location where they are. You can see where they've been. You can see where they're going to. You can see where they are at that moment in time. And you can go just do the business of rescue. Um, and in a sea rescue sense, people cannot survive floating on the ocean for an infinite amount of time. They, they need to get to a, a, a panel of relative safety um, and they need to you know, be brought back to shore. And Safe Tracks makes a huge difference in that. I think also a lot of people who are on the panel tonight will, will be dive industry professionals. Um, and part of being a dive industry professional is the fact that there's, a, there's an economic side to the joy that you have of being on the ocean. You know, business depends on people wanting to take part in, in your industry. And in the dive industry, that's just one such industry in the water sports economy of the South African coast. Um, and every time an incident happens, a negative incident, there's always a lot of, of bad press which go with it. And part of that bad press is, is a negative economic impact. Um, less people want to do a sport because it's not as safe. Um, you know, so an industry has got a responsibility to self-regulate. And that's also where sea rescue comes into it is, is, you know, we exist for the sole purpose of saving lives in South African waters, but there's a huge economic impact that's, that comes off every life that you saved, every good story that you can tell. You know, people are inspired that using the ocean, whether you're a surf ski paddler or a kayaker or a, uh, a kite surfer or a surfer or a scuba diver or a yachtsman, you know, a, a range of water sports indus industries. And I think there's actually been studies done, but the, the, the economic impact of the water sports industry, if you take all water sports users, is in the billions of rands. You know, it's not a small thing in the, in the greater South African economy. Um, so that's, you know, one of the major drivers of, of doing what we want to do, you know, beyond just saving lives. Is there's, there's a community that, that we support in that, in that process. Um, one of the challenges with, you know, with SAR and search and rescue and, and taking the search out of search and rescue is obviously the cost. Um, you know, earlier when Monet was doing the introduction, he, he said a, a mnemonic, which was the GMDSS system, the Global Maritime Distress Safety and Security System, which, um, you know, for, for mariners as such, it's expensive to have the system set up, to have the proper tracking equipment, you know, a, a simple AIS MOB device will be 3,000 Rand, a PLB will be four or 5,000 Rand or more, um, you know, and, and these devices which are available to track you. Um, the beauty of Safe Tracks is it's an app which is freely downloadable on, on the South African App Store. Um, so it actually costs the user nothing other than the technology that you know, most people have already. It's really just a factor of downloading that application and using it. Um, yeah, and that's really what it's come down to. And there's a whole lot of benefits to Safe Tracks. And I think the, the best person to tell you about it is, is Nessa Malone herself. Um, and I'm going to hand over to her. Thanks, Brett. Um, let me just get set up here. I'll just uh, share my screen and get into presentation mode. Uh, let's see. So you should be able to see the slides in presentation mode. Correct. All looking yep. good. Good stuff. Okay. Um, so yeah, look, thanks, uh, thanks, Brett, for that. That's um, I, <laughs> it's covered a lot in my presentation, so I'll probably have to skip over a few slides. Um, but yeah, look, it's um, I suppose um, just for those of you kind of joined later. Um, my name is Nessa Malone. I'm the Safe Tracks Product Manager, and I work with organisations like the RNS or NSRI um, in South Africa and other search and rescue coast guard. Um, military kind of um, or navy um, or even boating associations around the world um, to develop a, a safe tracks um, uh, vessel tracking and alerting platform um, and and I suppose really uh, it is a 
a, a kind of a culmination of work with, uh, I suppose, the boating community and those organisations that has resulted in, in such a platform. Um, and um, obviously, I just want to say thanks as well for Mornay to for offering to, to kind of feature in this this webinar. So it's um, it's a good opportunity to uh, to kind of dive into <laughs> excuse the pun to dive into a little bit more of the the features that um, that can be used, uh, particularly when diving. Um, but you know, as well as going out on on other water sports activities from surf skiing to, to swimming to kayaking um, or fishing or anything else that um, that you're going in the water for. Um, so uh, really what what is safe tracks it's it's a vessel registration tracking and alerting solution um, it's typically for leisure craft user users that um, generally by law don't have to have you know a GMDSS um, equipment or um, or it, it's kind of I suppose seen as a mobile AIS and that's uh, using cellular technology and I think that's kind of the, the simplest way of putting it and it allows search and rescue authorities such as the NSRI um, to kind of fill a gap of where they um, may may not have a situ situational awareness of leisure craft user users when uh, they're out at sea. Um, and that's by a by means of a monitoring console. And it's a monitoring console is basically a website that they can log into um, and, and easily see tracking and distress alerting uh, data if they need to. So SafeTrax is currently responsible for more than 10% of lifeboat missions in Norway and the Netherlands, and its, it's usage is steadily increasing around the world. Um, uh, so at the, currently it's, it's live in 11 countries um, with Sweden going live next year. Um, and so for those of you that are maybe listening outside of South Africa, it's probably important to note that there are local versions of safe tracks available. So if you're based in uh, say the Netherlands, Germany, uh, Norway, Finland, Spain, Australia, um, Dubai, Denmark, Sweden, um, or the UK and Ireland, you can actually install the local version of Safe Tracks, and that's that would be advisable to do so because your you you would your data and your your tracking data and your incident alerting data would be fed back to the local authorities in those countries. Um, but for the most part today, we'll, we'll focus on the RSA version of Safe Tracks, so the, the, the NSRI basically version of Safe Tracks. Um, so each year we get together with um, our customers and, and any other stakeholders. So they may be other Coast Guard agencies or other interested parties. Um, and in our Safe Tracks user group meeting. And we review, it's typically around maybe October or December, um, and we typically review the, the previous season and we go through uh, the feedback from our customers and from boating associations and the community. And we plan for the year ahead. So every feature and every change that we make within Safe Tracks is as, as a, is as a result of direct feedback um, from search and rescue agencies. So this isn't a, a piece of software. You know, as um, I mentioned earlier, we're a software company based in Ireland. Um, there's 230 developers in, in the company, and we we have a certain skill set and you know we we develop software um, but we do rely on the people actually going out and launching and the guys that are, are going out and rescuing people to uh, direct us in terms of what features and what improvements and, and kind of what what makes uh, I guess what would help to take the search out of search and rescue. And that's that's kind of where everything is uh, re revolving around for us um, in terms of of, of that caveat of, of taking the search out of search and rescue. Um, and so this is really what it's all about. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of our safe our safe track search and rescue customers had a very similar experience um, this summer, the European summer at least, where there was a significant increase of traffic on the water due to COVID-19 travel restrictions, um, with a similar increase then in the number of missions and, and call outs as a result. And, and Safe Tracks was no different in terms of the number of call outs and number of missions that it was associated with. Uh, so, for example, from the start of May to the end of August, there was over 800 rescue and assistance missions um, across three countries, the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway. Um, so that equates to about six missions a day over those that three month period. So um, they really had a very, very busy summer. And and having the facility of, of safe tracks available to them um, assists in that, I think, as, as, as 
as Brett alluded to there, is in terms of an economic benefit, in terms of shortening the the the, the search, but also obviously um, at the end of the day that you know of actually saving lives at sea. Um, so that's that's again this is this is our primary focus, and um, it's uh, why we do what we do. So just to give you an idea of the types of missions that we that we're I suppose that the safe tracks is used in, um, in uh, Millis Point or sorry Table Bay actually it was in September um, there was two paddlers and fishing kayaks um, gone out in heavy sea conditions, and they actually had installed safe tracks the day before they went out. Um, what one paddler actually fell out um, of the kayak and um, the other person uh, still in the kayak called the um, NSRI Emergency Operations Centre using this the RSA Safe Tracks app. And he explained that he was using his fishing, ki fishing kayak to tow the other kayak while his friend was still in the water holding onto the semi-submerged kayak. Um, there happened to be an NSRI crew on a training exercise um, on the water and they were quickly diverted and located the, 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 the two um, paddlers two nautical miles offshore. Uh, likewise in Germany, there was a um, DGZRS, which is the German Sea Rescue Authority. They're basically the equivalent of the NSRI in, uh, in Germany. Um, their MRCC was alerted by an emergency contact who had received a sail plan overdue uh, SMS message. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a sail plan um, shortly, but the MRCC were quickly able to, or, sorry, eventually able to make contact with the sailor because the, the emergency contact had been trying to make contact with them. Um, and he reported that, um, that his boat was taking on water due to uh, strong winds and rough seas. Um, so the MRCC was able to quickly access the planned route that the, the, the sailor had, as well as their last known position, um, using the monitoring console. Um, and two lifeboats made their way to, uh, to the sailor's location and escorted the damaged yacht back to, back to safety. Uh, coming back to South Africa then, in Millis Point, um, a group of surf skiers planned to undertake a 15 kilometer trip um, in severe we weather around Millis, uh, Millis Point. Um, again, there was strong winds and high seas, and one surf skier got separated and found himself drifting quite quickly uh, away from the shoreline. Um, he used the uh, emergency call function, which um, actually activated uh, an alert and track feature that we um, that we included or we we uh, created last year, um, which meant basically that his position was was being recorded every five minutes, um, and. Um, because of that, when the, the NSRI actually got the alert and saw the console, um, the console actually showed um, him to be drifting two knots um, out to sea away from the shoreline. And they were able to get to have an updated position once they were actually launched and in the water and on, the, on their way to the, to the person. Um, and finally, then in Norway, there was um, uh, it was actually last uh, October last year, um, and there was a family. There was a father and three children uh, went out fishing on a, on a on a boat, and their boat actually capsized in in cold, windy weather. Um, the the te water temperatures were around eleven to thirteen degrees um, Celsius, so not not conditions where you want to be in the water for any period of time. Um, they were they um, they managed to get to a small islet, and one person with a phone managed to make that emergency call using the the ORS, uh, the, the Norwegian version of Safe Tracks, um, and uh, that immediately sent a position and an alert to the uh, coastal radio, the Norwegian coastal radio, and the Norwegian Sea Rescue. Um, and after that, he was it was took 26 minutes just to get to the to the um, to the family and and rescue them from the, the from the islet. So it really shortens that um, that search uh, period. Um, and um, you know, in in and assists in an overall um, search and rescue operation. So, um, just in terms of diving uh, as recreational um, use, uh, it is used, I suppose, as a um, as a tool to track and um, to track and can can alert as well in similar situations. Um, these are screenshots from our um, our co CEO John Murphy. He is an avid diver. He's part of the West Cork Underwater Search and Recovery Unit uh, here in Ireland, um, and so he uses Safe Tracks when he's when he goes out. And I'll explain a little bit about how he's using it, um, but you can see there's just kind of a dive flag there of where 
um, the divers actually go into the water and they, they come out of the water. So I'll talk a little bit about more about that in, in just a few minutes. Um, I guess, um, I, I suppose just to point out as well, there are UK colleagues at the Royal Yachting Association recently did a special interest webinar with BSAC members um, on Safe Tracks. So we're, we're really glad to have the opportunity to talk to Dan members as well today about how to use Safe Tracks when, when diving. Um, I guess there is a side of safe tracks um, that in terms of diving that uh, I think is worth highlighting because it may be relevant to some of the people on the, the, the call today. Um, I mentioned that our co-CEO John Murphy is part of the West Cork Underwater Search and Rescue um, uh, organization um, called WUXAR for short. Um, and Safe tracks is essentially used to help voluntary uh, dive units in the coordination of search and recovery and has been um, for the last couple of years. Um, so in 2015, uh, Safe tracks was used in the coordination of an underwater search and recovery operation in the southwest of Ireland involving the recovery of a 20 year old male. Um, the coordination of events offshore was assisted by the use of Safe tracks, which allowed the Coast Guard in association with local search and rescue organizations such as WUXAR to track all vessels involved and provide added security to the overall operation. So each dive boat downloaded safe tracks and uh, initiated sail plans. And in doing so, safe tracks was able to track the position of the volunteer dive boats, allowing the, the teams to sequence the overall dive recovery plans, while at the same time, because they were logging sail plans, um, the Irish Coast Guard um, had access and, and a, a visual on areas that were covered. Um, and also from a, a safety perspective, provided that additional um, a different additional kind of safety blanket. The operation lasted two days, involved 94 divers and 14 boats. Um, and again, it's you know it was a multi-agency approach and, and using safe tracks in a voluntary, uh, you know, for the voluntary dive boats helped to, I suppose it really uh, contributed to the overall uh, safe um, recovery operation. In uh, likewise, in 2017, uh, there was an incident with a rescue helicopter, Rescue 116, here in Ireland. Um, it crashed after it struck uh, Black Rock Island here off the west coast of Ireland on its way to a fueling stop um, in Black Sod. Um, the search and recovery operation really was to find and recover the bodies of two missing helicopter crewmen. And it was one of the largest search and rescue operations in the history of the state, um, involving 162 volunteers um, from divers, cox coxswains to shore support shore support. Um, there was 128 divers, 132 diver dives actually took place as well over that period and there was 16 divers that were go going in and out to the to the site. Um, all dive ribs were using safe tracks allowing shore operations to track in real time the positions of all rest of all west vessels. Um, you know the site itself was nine miles offshore and um, so safe tracks again uh, assisted in the managing the the operation remotely. And finally, uh, the safe tracks was also used in um, to track volunteer volunteer diver search and recovery um, units to recover a, fish, a missing fisherman off the west coast of, of Cork here, um, in 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 some in somewhat challenging conditions. Um, so the volunteer units were working with the the navy, the coast guard, and civil defence units. And the search was over two days. Um, all six dive boats again were using safe tracks, allowing them to effectively coordinate the operation from land um, three miles away from the dive site. Uh, so you can see here just on the screenshot of the monitoring console uh, of one of those dive boats, um, you know, it just shows the track. And the series of lines here to the north of the island um, shows the boats track over where the, the person was actually recovered. So it's it's just another aspect of I guess safe tracks and in a in in terms of a diving activity of how it can be used, um, and there are certain features within uh, the 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 app that I can I can explain a little bit as well potentially how they can be used for say a local training or uh, local clubs perhaps um, if there's multiple vessels going out and there's shore contacts um, trying to keep an eye on on operations. So um, basically, there's, there's three main functions of safe tracks. So there's the vessel craft registration element, um, its ability to track itself, your position, and the incident alerting. So I'll, I'll be touching on these three elements uh, throughout the presentation. 
Um, so what what is actually safe track? So you know, what what is made what is it made up of? It's basically the smartphone apps. You have your iOS and Android mobile apps. You have a safe track server that's managing all of the the, the it's, it's monitoring all the um, active sale plans, looking after the trips, communicating with any um, with the the mail providers or the SMS providers to escalate or to send out escalation messages. And finally, then there's the monitoring console, which um, the guys in NSRI have, uh, have access to, so they can use it to track and search for, um, for safe tracks boaters. So just going into a little bit more detail then on the, the mobile app. Um, so as mentioned, Safe tracks primarily is a tracking application with a, an integrated alert button function. Um, but it, th there is a lot more to it than just that. Um, there's two tracking modes, which, uh, and I'll go into these features in a little bit more detail um, as well. But so there's two tracking modes. There's the ability to call for help, um, which sends your location uh, to the um, local search and rescue authorities. There's a divers down function which basically is a digital flag alpha. It's, um, it, it creates, a, um, I suppose, a virtual exclusion zone around diving areas that, that people are, um, are active in. There's group, uh, group activity tracking. So um, again, if you have a group of people going out and you have a single contact to shore, um, there's a facility there for that contact to shore to, to monitor or to track a couple of people at a time. Message center, so uh, within the console, there is the facility for the NSRI to actually send out messages directly to users based on location um, or general broadcasts um, for various reasons. And finally, vessel checklists. So um, we do provide a list of uh, default checklist items that you can go in and personalize and create and add to your own, um, your own checklist items. So again, and, um, just a kind of a safety reminder and, and having that mindset before you go out that you have everything that you need that you should have. So I mentioned two tracking modes, uh, sale plan mode and track only mode. Uh, sale plan mode is basically where you're filing a sale plan. You have a rough idea of where you're going, what time you'll be, ba be back. And really it centers around the concept of having an estimated time of arrival, your ETA. And if you exceed that ETA, then the server is, is, is monitoring that and it will start to send out messages to your emergency contacts um, should you go overdue. Um, there's, one sale, there's one recording interval in sale plan mode. Um, and that's basically that it transmits every kilometer or every five minutes when stationary. Uh, whereas in track only mode, you have, first of all, you have four tracking intervals that you can choose from. And um, so you've continuous five minute and 10 minute, and 30 minute recording intervals. So depending on the type of activity you have and depending on your battery and your access to power on board, um, you can adjust the, the recording intervals. Um, the main difference between the two is that uh, sale plan mode triggers an escalation SMS to your emergency contacts and to the SRI if you go overdue. Um, track only mode doesn't have that escalation um, procedure, uh, so it's kind of a quick start mode. Um, it, you know, you're not recording a passage plan and it doesn't trigger SMS uh, messages if, uh, if you're exceeding that ETA. So sale plan mode itself, uh, basically you uh, choose the, the vessel or craft that you're on into your estimated time of arrival, uh, the number of people on board, your activity, uh, choose your start, waypoint, and end point. Um, and at that point, once your trip starts or your sail plan starts, the monitoring console has a record of what your plan was for that trip. So if anything else happens after that, at least you have that planned route and they know the direction that you were intended to go. So they, you know, it's, it's more information that they would have um, without following this, without following the sail plan. Um, as mentioned earlier, if, if you go overdue, so if you if you say, for example, put in an ETA of three o'clock um, and if your trip goes overdue, it start, then starts to send out the escalation, escalation messages. And it's important to mention that it is the server sending out those messages. It's not sent from the phone. So again, if your phone is, is submerged in water, um, it's the server that's, that's looking after um, that communication. Um, and to avoid, avoid a false alert, you're either, you can amend your ETA. So if you decide you want to stay out longer, you can extend it or you can obviously end it when you're back, um, back, back safely. And how sale plan mode works. So really it's you register an account, you then register your vessel or craft. 
um, you only need to do that once and um, and then you create your trip on the departure. So as mentioned, you select your vessel into your ETA, the number of people on board, your activity, uh, your emergency contacts and your start waypoint and end point and they hit start. And that from that point forward, it starts tracking every kilometer or every five minutes uh, when stationary. Um, once you get to your destination, you um, you can close it out or as mentioned earlier, you can amend it. Um, so if, if you want to stay out longer, you can amend that ETA and the server updates accordingly. Um, if you don't uh, close off that trip, that's where the uh, the SMS messages are, get sent out. Um, for the NSRI in uh, South Africa, they have, uh, I suppose they have a quite a short escalation period, um, obviously given the water temperatures and um, um, you know, that that it's it's it, it starts alerting quite uh, quite early. Um, so, for example, where ETA say for example is at three o'clock again, and um, just fifteen minutes before three o'clock, it will send a local notification to the boater saying, you know, just advising that their trip is is approaching the overdue. At three o'clock, it's um, once if, if they still haven't kind of extended that ETA, um, they'll receive another message. And by local notification, it just means a pop up in, in your app. So similar to, to what you would see for um, a news application. And uh, they also receive an SMS message. Uh, their emergency contact also receives an SMS message at this point um, advising them to try and make contact with, uh, with you. Um, and again, the MRCC would receive a, their initial email just advising that uh, this trip has gone overdue. Uh, 15 minutes passed, if they still haven't closed out or amended their trip details, another set of, of communication is sent out both to the boater and emergency contact. Um, and then half an hour later, the boater and the, the MRCC receive a, another reminder. So um, at this point, I think the, the NSRI, I guess, are, are trying to make contact with the person um, or they would try and make contact maybe with the emergency contact um, to see if they can get uh, an update on, on, um, on the status of, of their well-being. So this is typically what the, uh, the, the monitoring console and the, the, the guys in the NSRI would see if they logged in and they saw an overdue sale plan. Um, so they would see the, the vessel name, the ETA, and the sale plan details. They would see an activity log of all the SMS activity um, or emails that have gone out as part of the sale plan um, overdue escalation procedure. Um, so they can see at what time they were sent and who they've been sent to. So who has been alerted um, of the overdue. Um, and each position, uh, as you can see here, has a um, has what we call a, a ping a ping data set and a ping basically contains a lot of information about the location um, such as the position itself the speed the heading they were the, the speed they were going at the time and um, what direction they're going they were going in uh, the battery level uh, the cell signal if it's on android uh, what time the 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 location was recorded how accurate was it so you know what level of confidence do we have on that location and what time is received on the server as well. So every time it sends a location, it sends those, um, those particular uh, details. Um, so we provide as much information as possible um, to the console and then uh, let's basically let the operator decide on, on the course of action. Track only mode, as mentioned, is a quick start option. Uh, there's no ETA monitoring. Um, they have to, the user has to um, literally select vessel, select the number of people on board and hit the tracking interval um, and hit start. Um, it's important to note that the user has to close out this manually. They have to click end. It's not enough to just swipe up the app to, to close it. Um, and there is a facility in the server to actually check for any active trips after periods of time if, there's, if, if, if people forget to, to close their trip. We will be making changes to the screen to um, include activities. Um, so you can, for example, choose decide to choose diving um in future version of of the screen um, and you'll also be given the option to select or not, or not to select a vessel so for example swimmers or um uh, guys that are coast steering or coastal walking um will have the option of, of using safe tracks without registering um, a vessel so how does track only mode work uh, Again, you have to register an account. There's no anonymous usage of, of safe tracks and you can register a vessel. Um, uh, 
and uh, just as we saw there, you you know, you're just selecting your vessel and um, your tracking interval and hitting start. And again, that sends the same type of information that we saw with the sail plan at regular intervals. And um, once you get to your destination, you're you're closing it out. So it's it's quite straightforward. In terms again of what the uh, monitoring console um, shows as part of a track only trip, um, there's a little less detail here in terms of you don't have a, a plan as such. So uh, but you still see the, the, the vessel name, the track only mode. I should have also mentioned here that when you click on this arrow, it expands uh, a little column to the right to show uh, the vessel details, the emergency contact information, um, and the uh, person's own contact information. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information there. And again, that, that ping or that, that uh, location update information contains a similar type of, of data that you would get for, for uh, sale plan mode with the addition of this recording interval. So um, the NSRI know when to expect the next, next update. So the types of uh, issues that we see, um, and it's something I suppose just to be aware of, of um, for your own phone. Um, so if you have an iPhone, it's important to just check location services that they're, all, they're set to always, um, and that they're always, I think it's iOS 14 and above, that has this precise on um, setting as well. So precise on basically means that we, we get a, an accurate location. If precise is set to off, it means we just get a townland or a regional um, location, which isn't uh, sufficient for search and rescue. So it's important that that's it. Um, if you have any issues in terms of tracking, um, there's other things you can do like turning on and off location services, make sure the time and date is set automatically restarting your device, uninstalling, reinstalling, and then um, that was the obvious one is just making sure you have a clear view of the sky. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in Android just because there's so many different manufacturers. Um, and this, I guess, you know, this we could be talking about any tracking application here um, in terms of the kind of the issues that we, we face um, in terms of various manufacturers settings. Um, but there are a few, I suppose, that are common between them. Um, they might be located in different sections of the phone. Um, so, you know, uh, um, maybe your, your battery optimization settings in a Huawei device might be in a different place to where you would find it in the Samsung. Um, but generally, if you use a, kind of a, the search function of the settings, you'll, you'll be able to find these. So just to make sure location services, again, is allowed to allow all the time. Um, and this basically, both of those kind of always allow all the time just means that if you use your uh, phone for something else, so if you decide to check your email or if you're on the phone, uh, on a phone call, while SafeTracks is tracking, it means that SafeTracks will track your location in the background. So it's in background use um, of, of, the, of the phone. So it's not, uh, you know, once you stop tracking, it's going to stop uh, tracking altogether. It's not going to continue to, to, to track you. So just to be aware of that, that it's, it's to facilitate tracking while, while you want to be tracked. Um, just to check the location method as well as set to high accuracy. Um, anything that, uh, particularly on Android, anything that can kill the app while um, to, to help for battery or to help for mobile data savings, uh, particularly on Android, can be problematic. So again, just to be mindful of that on your own phone and maybe just to check that, uh, for example, battery optimization is set to manual. It's not and that it's not set to run automatically or to, to destroy it if it's pushed to the background. Um, so it's, it's worth just having a look at these settings if you find that your, your, your safe tracks app or, or any other tracking app isn't um, isn't performing as it should. Um, so emergency calls. So basically, once you hit that emergency call button, it presents the uh, emer the red emergency uh, call button. Uh, once you press that, it goes straight to the uh, calling function on the phone. So it goes straight to calling the emergency, the NSRI emergency number. Um, it puts the call through and in the background, it also sends an emergency location update to the SafeTracks uh, server. And that does a few things that, first of all, displays the alert on the monitoring console with all of the distress alert details. Um, and it also sends an, an email to the, um, to the NSRI just to notify, uh, notify them as well of the emergency call. Um, and that, I suppose, the emergency call, uh, the emergency location update is obviously um, depending on, on whether or not you have a lo an internet connection at the time of, of actually making the call. Uh, alert and track. Uh, so this was actually um, 
a an enhancement that we made as a result of feedback from a, a South African surf skier that was taking part in a in a, a surf ski race. Um, I think it was last year, or the year before, um, and basically, uh, it alert and track. Uh, it kicks in basically if you make that emergency call um, it starts to transmit position updates every five uh, every five minutes so this addresses the I suppose an issue where you maybe have a bad uh, time to first fix or that the person is actually drifting uh, which is probably more more of um, a common scenario so uh, alert and track will track in or sorry will kick in if you um if you just literally open the app, press that call for help button and start, um, you know, it, it'll start tracking every five minutes. It'll also kick in if you have your interval set to 10 minutes or 30 minutes um, uh, intervals, because what it does there is it dials it back to five minutes. So we get more of a regular uh, position update um, in sale plan mode or track only five minutes or continuous modes. It's sending a regular uh, location update as it is, so we don't uh, we don't um, trigger that alert and track um, mode. So it's just to be aware of, of I suppose what happens when when that emergency call button is pressed. Um, dive is down. So I mentioned earlier that there's um, I suppose what we call a digital flag alpha uh, feature within the Safe Tracks app. Um, so in sail plan mode. If you um, if you register a certain type of vessel, such as a rib or um, a, a motorboat with an engine, or a certain type of vessel that I suppose is more obvious that you can kind of dive from, um, you'll be given diving as an activity as part of that. So the the type of vessel that you register up here is connected to the activities. Um, so. If you say register a rib, you'll see diving as an activity. Once you select diving as an activity, you'll get a divers down button once your trip is in progress. Um, and once you arrive at the dive site, basically you're pressing that divers down button once, once um, people are, are going to the water. Um, and what this does is that it creates a one kilometer exclusion or, or warning zone around the, the point of where the, the flag was raised. Um, so that if other safe tracks vessels are entering the area, they will get a notification to say that there are currently divers in the area and uh, basically to stay clear of the of the um, the dive area. So they can actually click on the view map and they will get a, a picture very similar to this. Um, so you'll see where the, the dive um, flag was raised um, and the exclusion zone uh, around that as well. So from the monitoring console perspective, um, the NSRI would see something quite similar. They'd also see when the, um, the divers down flag will appear in the map where the divers down button was first pressed um, and, and also will show that one kilometer virtual exclusion zone uh, within the map. They'll also see the activity log update with the, the time the divers went down and their location. Um, once the, 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 the cox or someone on board, um, once the divers start to come up again, the, they can press the divers up button. Um, and so the, the map then will update to, to flag where the divers were recovered from and again, update that activity log. So from that point of view, um, basically the, the NSRI, um, the uh, Emergency Operations Centre actually know that, the, you know, that I suppose what time divers went into the water, if they came out. Um, and it's again, just having that, I suppose, awareness of, um, of what's happening on, on the water at any point in time. Um, sharing your location. So this is, uh, can be a helpful tool to, um, to keep persons ashore, could be emergency contacts or your loved ones ashore, um, just of your, of, of where, keeping up to date of your position. Um, so if you create a track only trip or a sale plan, you can hit the share button and you'll get a um, option of SMS, email, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, number of other social media um, options. And that will pre-populate um, the whatever the message or the email or the Facebook message with a URL. Um, and once you send that off, the, the person receiving it will click on the URL and they'll see a, a public facing um, tracking web page similar to what you see here. So it's very similar as well to what you would see on the console, um, just with um, a lot less, I suppose, information. Um, but you would see the position, the speed, the heading, what time their last recorded position was, how, how, how accurate that position was as well. 
um, so it just gives that, that uh, I suppose, peace of mind um, and maybe awareness as well for your emergency contacts, just to say, okay, well, Nessa's gone out today and I'll just keep an eye on it or, you know, I haven't kind of heard from her in a while and it's just maybe you might want to check in. So it's just having an awareness as well of somebody on shore, just um, kind of uh, keeping an eye out for you. Um, so if you're in a club or a dive, um, a dive club or um, any other club or you're going out kayaking or surf skiing with a group of people, um, you can use the, the group activity or the group event code to um, have contacts ashore track multiple, multiple um, members of your group. So to do that, uh, you go into the track only mode screen, you hit the group event code. You hit the generate private group code button. And what that does is generates a 24 hour code. And this can be shared um, with six people. Um, if you hit OK, it adds that code to your own trip. And once you hit start and then share that trip um, with whoever is um, with maybe your contact ashore, that person that's ashore and will receive a URL with a live tracking URL, a, a live tracking web page, excuse me. Um, and be able to see the six members and their positions as they're as they're going in the water. Um, so this again allows for um, I guess the the person ashore to be able to have uh, a little bit more oversight about with um, I suppose the people that um, are members of a dive club or members of their group. Um, and it's something so I suppose is a feature that we'll be building on as well, so that in time. Um, you know, if you're part of that group and if you're out on a, a, a rib or a dive boat, that you can see other people's positions on a map um, within that group. Um, and as well in time that you can, you know, if somebody calls for help within that, that they would be alerted as well as the NSRI. So that's that's something that we'll be building on top of um, in the next uh, in the next few months. Um, so the, the group activity. So it's worthwhile just checking out and, and you know, with any of these features, it's, you know, maybe apart from the emergency call button, you know, you can start a trip and, and just try it out and see how, it's, how it works. You know, if you're a little bit apprehensive about using it, just, um, you know, just, um, I suppose, just go through the app and uh, try things, you know, try starting a trip, try the group activity code and the divers down or any of those. And, um, you know, it's, it's worth just exploring and getting familiar with it. Um, so just uh, just a few more things just to highlight, I guess the there is the map feature within the app that allows you to uh, check the weather. It's connects to wire.no. You can check the VHF channels as well in that locality um, using that Explorer feature. Um, and you just literally press and hold that the map and you'll you can drop a pin in the map and it'll, it'll return the, the VHF coastal radios once you hit that button. And there are map layers as well that will show you the NSRI lifeboat stations and you can get contact phone numbers for them as well. Um, and in time we can, you know, we can look to add more information that's that's relevant. In terms of checklists, there is a facility, as, my, as I mentioned, to create your own checklist um, and to personalize uh, a, a checklist that, you know, from, uh, I suppose, a default list that we have put together. So again, we worked with um, at search and rescue agencies to show the number of, of or to put together a list of uh, checklist items that are relevant to uh, a particular vessel. So there's 17 type of vessels and we've we've uh, created checklist items for each one, but you can actually go in and add your own items. So you can add your your, your weight belt or whatever uh, diving equipment um, that you want to add. So it's again, just before you go out in a sale plan, you can actually step through these checklist items just to make sure that you have what you need before you actually start your trip. Um, incident photo, if there's a scenario on board um, where you want to um, maybe communicate to uh, the NSRI by, via vessel or via photo, you can do, so, can do so using the incident photo. So on the emergency call screen, there is a send photo to the, to the, at the request to the operator button. Um, and once you press that, it brings up the camera function or the, uh, the photo library. You can choose a photo. So this could perhaps help in a maybe a medical situation, or perhaps you've some, seen something on the water that you um, that might be easier to communicate um, via a, a photo message, um, and that appears in the console just like that. And the NSRI would receive the captured time, uh, what time it was received, and the location as well as the photo as well as your own location. 
Um, so again, it might be just maybe something from a medical point of view that might be of use um, if you if you need assistance. And finally, just to, I suppose just something that comes up every so often, just to understand that um, you know it, it does rely on cellular data to actually transmit locations. So it has um, a GNSS chip on the the phone itself, um, and that will re retrieve your your positions. However, um, you know the, you may go into radio or. or I was going to say radio shadows, but cellular data shadows as well. Um, and what it does is that it will keep getting your position and it will keep trying to connect to the cellular uh, data provider. Um, and once you, uh, once it kind of reconnects again, it'll backfill or send the backfill of location information to the server uh, and then start transmitting in real time again. Um, so there is a facility to, I suppose, in and out or to be in and out of self coverage there is also uh, battery management as well on the apps so that if your battery is running low it stops tracking at uh, 10 percent so um so there is uh, you know we're mindful as well that uh, there is you know tracking obviously takes battery um so we we have some battery management as well within the app so that's that's basically the presentation um i hope i've covered kind of the main areas but um i guess i'll stop there and Pause for questions because I haven't actually looked at the Q and A um, Q and A mm. section at all. So, Nessa, wow, that was um, extremely impressive. Uh, there's so many things um, that I need to pick your brain on, but that'll come after this presentation. But uh, and uh, Brett, obviously, I'll include you. Um, yeah, a lot of great things there. So, jeez, uh, it's wow. There are some questions. I see Brett is answered one or two of them <clears throat> but um, some of them you've answered uh, are you happy for me to read them out Nessa and we take them from there um, I'll start the one or two here in the uh, the chat uh, area uh, Duncan Scott he says uh, the UK RYA app uh, is hosted on a smartphone which requires a good 3G signal is this a requirement uh, everywhere yeah, so I think you've answered that and um, uh, so, Duncan, I hope that uh, helps you. He's got another yeah. question. He says, um, uh, this uh, is in addition uh, to use EP, uh, ERBs or DSC um, channel 16 VHF emergency call. So I guess in a way answered himself or would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, like it, I guess where we would we where we would see safe tracks fitting in as such is that, uh, you know, our advice would be to whatever you can afford and whatever you, you know safety equipment that you you want or should have on board is really um you know is, is kind of what we would advise as well um we would see safe tracks as very much a complementary tool so if you if you have an epurb if you have a plb mm. um for sure absolutely use that and safe tracks can be used as a complementary you know just to have in your back pocket register your vessel and particularly with the RYA version the the coast guard actually um have used that as a as a as to replace their cg66 voluntary uh, vessel registration system so even if you never used it for tracking or alerting if you got into trouble and called over vhf um, and gave mm. them your call sign your mmsi and um, they could use the search uh, function within safe tracks and bring up your your complete vessel details your emergency contacts and your your own uh, personal contact details um there is a facility as well within the vessel registration to register or to add um, PLB numbers and uh, EPIRB uh, call signs. So, um, so it's it's certainly you know it's certainly used to complement those tools, and we're certainly not kind of using to to replace them. Um, if that, I hope that answers your question. Um, so yeah, if, if, if I may sort of yeah, come come in there as well, I think. That's, a, that's an essential component of safety in any water sport. Is, is safety is, is a combination of layers. Um, you should never rely on one tool to keep you safe. Um, so SafeTrax is a great tool, but it's one tool in a layer of, of things that you should have. You know, as a diver, having a, a surface marker boy, having a whistle. Um, and, you know, depending on the extremity of the sport that you're, you're pursuing, you should have extra pieces of equipment that, that are going to keep you out of trouble and get you out of trouble. Don't just rely on one tool. There's nothing is fail safe. If the if your absolutely. phone battery runs out, safe tracks is not going to work. Yeah, out of yeah absolutely. It's not going to work. So you know you need to keep that in the back of your mind as well. It's mm -hmm. it is great, um, but have other things too. 
Um, and it's certainly not supposed to replace EPIRB or DOC. It's it's an addition to yeah. um, the point. Yeah, Brett, great feedback. I mean, it's it's something that we, uh, you know, spread quite uh, often is to say emergency planning uh, comes in many forms, you know, and you have to sort of uh, look at it, like you said, layer it and have backup plans for backup plans and sort of work through any kind of scenario. All right. So um, there's another question here from Sarah Walsh. She says, I'm a Kilkenny diver based in Korea. I'm curious to know if Safe Tracks is based on Google Maps only. Now, I think you touched on that, but might be worthwhile just, um, you know, elaborating on that a bit. Yeah, um, so uh, there's a couple of things in that. I'm not, so basically, Safe Tracks on the Android version does use Google Maps. On the um, iOS version, uses the Apple Maps. Um, if you're in, I guess, um, might be a bit of a challenge in Korea, I guess, because there isn't, um, I suppose, currently um, a an authority that is, um, it's not locally available as such. And so you would need to use another version of safe tracks. Um, and it's important to note that if you are using another version of safe tracks, that's not available in your country, that all data. So incident alerting um, tracking information is going back to that, uh, to that, uh, I suppose, server as such. So if, if for example, you use the NSRI version, it's the NSRI uh, Emergency Operations Center would be getting any alerts, tracking information. Um, so that's, I suppose, just to be aware of, of that as well, just to note, um, mm. I, again, I'm not quite sure if that adds to your question, but um, that's, I suppose, it's just two things I wanted to we'll flag there in terms of both the maps and usage as well outside of, um, of uh, those, I suppose, safe tracks, localized versions. Mm. Okay. So um, we've got Alf, uh, he, uh, I think you've answered this, but here goes. Uh, I might have missed uh, that, but uh, what are the key differences to uh, say the safe tracks and then the EPRBs, um, you know, uh, looking forward to the answer. Oh, well, I'll, I'll try that one. Okay. So, so, so an EPIRB um, is a electronic position indicating radio beacon. Um, so it's a device you can purchase um, you know, from, a, from a marine sort of reta re re retailer. Um, it, it's a bit more of an expensive device and it's probably something that, that's mandated on ships which are more than 300 gross tons. So, so it's sort of primarily designed for the large vessel sort of market commercial shipping. Um, you can purchase EPIRBs for your smaller vessels. And in fact, at, at Sea Rescue on our large class one vessels, we, we carry EPIRBs sort of voluntarily um, as one of those layers of safety that we were speaking about. Um, and EPIRB, the methodology of how it works is it's, it basically communicates your location data when you activate it. So it's not a constant tracking device. So when your vessel is in distress, um, you can activate your EPIRB or if your vessel sinks and it's got a hydrostatic release, which activates the EPIRB when it gets wet. Um, and it sends your location information and the registration information that is loaded into that EPIRB into a database um, up to a satellite. You know, there's a global satellite system and that communicates it to a, a local user terminal, which are sort of placed around the world. In South Africa, that's based here in, in Cape Town, who will then communicate that to the local Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, who will alert you know, the, the closest rescue sort of network. So it's, it's, a, it's a part of the GMDSS system. Um, it is costly. It, it's a bit of a process that works. It works really, really well. It's a very robust system. Um, you know, the challenges with it is A, the cost, and B, the fact that it has to be registered. So when you purchase your EPIRB, you have to register it on a database with the MRCC. Um, different countries around the world have slightly different processes and different registration methods. Um, but in South Africa, you have to contact the local MRCC with your data of your vessel, who it's owned to. When you sell your vessel, you've got to update it. So there's a bit of administration with it. Um, but yeah, it's a good system. Safe tracks is supposed to be, you know, a low cost initiative on a cell phone that you're carrying already. You know, it's a free app for mm -hmm. download. It's not designed to compete with an EPIRB. Um, an EPIRB will, you know, conceivably work anywhere in the world. Safe tracks will only work well when your, your cell phone has got data connection. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's used for the for near shore in cell phone signal. So if you're planning a trip from here to Antarctica, unless you've got satellite uh, data, um, you're only going to be tracked for a couple of kilometers of <laughs> EPIRB will, will get you most of the way there. Hopefully that answers that one. 
Yeah, Brett, I think that was a great answer. And once again, highlighting, as you said, having different layers at your disposal. And I saw Cleve uh, Robertson, um, obviously uh, part of the NSRI, uh, made a comment, uh, just, you know, have a, if you're on a vessel, a cigarette kind of lighter or, or section to plug in so you can charge your, your phone and that you don't lose that power. So that's that's great advice. Mm. Um, yeah. While Things I like asked the... Bank, yeah, make know, a sorry? huge difference. I mean... Uh, you, you know, you get those power banks, which give you up to five charges, you know, mm. things like that, adding a, a charger, you know, the, the battery problem is actually very resolvable. Yeah. So um, while I uh, just address uh, the question from Jenny, Brett, can I ask you maybe to read through, uh, Kevin gave quite a long, um, I don't know if there aren't uh, questions or just feedback there in the Q&A box. Uh, do you mind just having a look at that? Uh, while Brett's busy with Kevin's um, feedback, uh, Jenny, I think that uh, both Nessa and uh, Brett now again answered your question about the um, will the app work if there's no cell phone uh, tower or facilities available. So, yeah, well, it needs that. Um, but Nessa, I think you highlighted at a stage that it's, as it comes and goes, it keeps tracking at the, at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. So it does keep getting your position because it doesn't actually need, uh, you know, a, a direct cellular connection for that. So it will mm -hmm. keep getting your position um, and then uh, breast transmit any positions it has once it gets a connection. Um, I think in, in most countries, there should be kind of a, a cell coverage mapper. So, uh, mm -hmm. for example, maybe Vodacom might provide a, um, a cell coverage uh, map so that you can actually check areas before you get out, go out as well. And if you are concerned about coverage uh, in the area, um, you may uh, prefer to use maybe the track only mode instead of your sail plan mode because um, you do need a uh, cell coverage to both start your trip to transmit live locations and to end your trip. Um, so, for example, in a sale plan scenario, um, you may find yourself in a situation where you don't have that cell coverage at the end of your trip to close it off. Um, and if you do find yourself in that situation, even getting in contact with the, the, your emergency contact, just say, look, I'm, I'm having, uh, I, I don't have cell coverage. And, and in lots of cases that you, you know, you can, you mightn't have cell coverage, but you might be able to make, or you probably will be able to make a call. Um, so the two are, are quite, you know, work on different uh, threads. So just to be aware of that as well. Um, and, you know, if you, if you find you can't close off your sale plan and you're going overdue, you might be panicking a little bit, just contact your mm. emergency contact and, um, and let them know that you're, you're okay. You just to your, you, you'll close it off when, when you can. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, that, I mean, great advice, Nessa. I mean, uh, and again, you know, sometimes we just need that little nudge to guide us to say, hey, there are services out there that we can um, access to, to plan better and, you know, hopefully avoid any, um, well, one, disappointments and accidents and emergencies from happening. But if they do, we're ready, I guess, you know. So, yeah. Exactly. All right, Brett. So, um, did you manage to get through that, uh, Kevin? Uh, uh, Kevin's um, yeah. uh, the feedback there. The epistle, that... yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Just one, maybe one question for Nessa before I answer that one was, which is pertinent to the last question or two, was was how much data SafeTracks actually uses. A lot of people mm -hmm. often hear a, a bit of fake news that it, it eats data and it's a very data expensive mm -hmm. thing. It, it's actually not. So maybe Nessa, you can just elucidate. You know, we're talking yeah. about kilobytes. It's, it's really yeah. Small. So. I, I I think for I suppose it depends it depends on a couple of things, um, but the, the most important thing really is is kind of what tracking interval you're using, um, and which mode you're in. So there are various um, maybe I suppose consumptions um, belong or you know depending on what mode you're in. Um, so it depends. I think we had a, a measurement. The last figure out off the top of my head was around 600k. Um, for an hour's trip, maybe over um, using the um, the five minute mode. So, um, but again, that'll vary vary with you know if you if you switch to continuous mode or ten minute mode. If you use you sail plan, that does vary. Um, I guess the what's interesting is that you know that the packet itself is quite small for sending location data because it's just you know it's just binary. It's just uh, you know it's it's basically kind of just sending um, the location data. 
Um, but we do have to wrap it in, in I suppose, security mechanisms, and that's where the weight is added in terms of um, in terms of data. But you know, in terms of overall data consumption, it's quite it's quite minimal. But what I can do is um, provide just an example, maybe, of you know, uh, x number of hours recording at a certain interval, and that might give people an idea. Mm. So do that. But it's yeah, it, it's kilobytes. It's less than a meg for oh, the yeah. average person in an hour. Yeah. It's really yeah. small. It's not absolutely yeah. I've heard people say it, it eats gigabytes of data, and uh, you know, it's rubbish. It's not. not no, unless they're, I don't know, sending lots of photos okay. in, or yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, not at all. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of people have that a false fear of that. Okay. Um, to answer Kevin's um, question, um, so the first point is the the specific products of AIS um, device or or DSC device. I can't comment on. Um, you know, you know, we we use pretty standard devices, so I can't say whether that product is is or is not a good product or not. Unfortunately, I can't contribute on that. Um, I don't know what the timing of the comments where he said it doesn't work is. So I know South Africa has been in a process over the last couple of years of of upgrading its coastal VHF radio network um, from analog to digital to sort of make us compliant with the GMDSSC Area A1 sort of requirements. Um, mm. So there is a process underway to finish that, and I think it's actually complete. Um, so AIS and the DSE are sort of two kind of different things. Um, so AIS is an automatic identification system, and that was sort of instituted you know, in the 90s, basically for vessels to automatically communicate with each other and give them information about their position, their speed, their rate of turn, um, with the main premise to avoid collisions. So it was a vessel to a vessel system initially. Then, sorry, and I'm giving you a really brief overview. You know, a technical person will probably shoot me. <laughs> then what happened is they basically put terrestrial um, VHF towers. AIS is a VHF signal, which um, was able to receive the, the vessel transmitted AIS information. And then they put that into a network and then um, programs like Marine Traffic or Fleet Mon basically um, aggregate all of that terrestrial marine data. So you can see where vessels are and all that information which is transmitted. So, so this system that I think you're referring to, sort of, you know, if you push that AIS sort of distress as such, it would have required that um, another vessel or a terrestrial VHF tower was within range of receiving that distress. So basically, in short, is if, if you're out of range, imagine you have a VHF radio and you key the microphone if there's no one in range to when you key that microphone, no one's going to hear you. Mm. Um, and AIS is basically like sending an SMS as opposed to making a phone call. So mm. if you send an SMS and no one is in range to receive that, it's that, that's, that message, it's not going to get through. Mm. So that doesn't mean that the, the Nautilus Marine System does or doesn't work. It, it was basically a factor of where they were and were there any um, receivers within range of that. So that's the first one. Um, and then the same thing with digital selective calling. Um, digital selective calling is essentially, yeah, it's, it's, it's an, equ an equivalency of sending an SMS as, as opposed to making a phone call. Um, and the factor would have been, was there a receiver in town? So if there was a, a VHF receiver to have received that, yeah, it would have worked. So that's uh, hopefully the short answer to that one. Okay. Wow. But I mean, a lot of interesting things. Yeah. And I think quite a lot of the listeners might not be aware of that. So Kevin, thanks for the great um, uh, question or questions and Brett, uh, you know, taking the time to sort of highlight all of that stuff. Um, for the moment, uh, Kevin, if there, it doesn't quite uh, answer your question, you know how to get hold of me. I'm happy to connect you with Brett. Brett, I'm sure you're happy to connect with uh, mm. uh, Kevin offline if you want to sort of uh, take the discussion further. Um, yeah. But for now, um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, if anybody has, uh, either via Facebook or Zoom, uh, you know, now's the time to pop it in. Um, uh, yeah, well, for the moment, while we wait for some additional um, questions, if they do come in, it's time for the lucky draw. So um, maybe before I do that, uh, Nessa and Brett, do you mind if I hand over to uh, Miguel again to finish off his uh, presentation on the uh, T-shirt designs? And let me just move my beard so you can see this beautiful uh, <laughs> design. Yeah. <laughs> All right, over to you, Miguel. All right, fantastic. Thanks a lot, Mornay. Um, and thanks a lot, Brett and Nessa. It's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic to see 
you know, what technology can do and how that can help save lives. It's a great presentation. Um, so just to continue on, um, for all those people, just um, all those new visitors uh, that just popped in, I'm just going to quickly continue on with uh, the presentation where I left off. This small, tiny little infomercial. Um, and we're going to continue basically with uh, 50 by scuba design, uh, pretty much our methodology, you know, how we work, um, and basically how we've achieved what we've achieved uh, with Dan in these last months. Um, so just so everybody's aware, um, being a design studio and a marketing studio, it's not all sort of, you know, paint here and color there. There is a, a part where we need to sort of sit down, think um, and investigate. It's not all art, to put it somehow. Um, so we can pretty much separate our method, uh, methodology in two parts. Um, the first part is literally trying to understand, you know, your brand, your competitors, your environment, your situation as a whole. Um, we basically do this through online meetings um, and investigating and brainstorming. Um, to come up basic, basically with um, what we would call the, um, the foundation of your project. Huh? We actually come up with a, a lovely little document that's kind of like a lovely little guide to understand um, where we are all coming from and where we are going. It's actually once we have that part done, um, which does take a while, but I mean, it's, it's definitely worth it, um, is when we come up with the creative process. So this is when we come up with the concept, you know, a slogan, um, our colors, what we're going to say, what we're going to do, how we're going to say it, um, and also, also the strategy. So we're pretty much saying, you know, now that we know what to do, or what to say, and who we're talking to, we need to find out a way of, you know, how to communicate it, where, etc. Um, and that basically leads to, you know, sketching, thinking a little bit more, and finally producing the, the final ideas and the final pieces. Um, just to put this kind of in practice really briefly, um, what happened with um, with Dan? Well, when you know when Divers Alert Network came to us, um, they they asked, okay, listen, we we, we want just to really um, sum up the briefing at the end of the. I want you know uh, dive oriented T-shirts. Um, they have to be fun, funky, fashionable. Um, obviously, they have to remind us, you know, what brand it, you know, what Dan is at the end. You know, what the brand is really talking about without going, you know, too much off topic. Um, so our conclusion is, you know, that you know um, when you kind of look at Dan's, you know the the eight pillars of Dan, you know, how they, they're, they're a great source of information in the sense, you know, what we're doing today and, and what they've been doing, you know, this, which is very important to be honest, when you have a reliable source of information, um, it's all about risk mitigation and, and, and dive safety products and training, um, and also covering, you know, all our members with, you know, great information and great hotlines and chamber networks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can pretty much conclude that you know, Dan is a key brand for both divers and dive operators alike. Um, you do feel safe when you are under that Dan flag wherever you are in the world. However, um, what we do notice is that in terms of Dan, um, as visually as a brand, when, when you know, as a user, as a diver, um, we can come up with this kind of conclusion, um, summing up, that you know, on, on a regular diving day, Dan will be in the background, um, but will turn into a protagonist when needed. Um, this is pretty much kind of like uh, your best friend who's gone abroad. Um, he's great to have there. You know you're, gonna, you, you, you're having a great time. You've had a great time together. You rely on him. Um, but despite the distance, um, you, know, he, you know he will always be there when, when he is needed. Um, so, Grabbing this, this insight, this kind of um, this, this value point, um, how did we sort of take this down to a, a, a concept, to a, a visual image, to an idea um, that we could build on? Um, we basically, from here, to sort of go into diver mode, let's say, we came up with the, the concept and slogan, um, Dan, you might not see us, but we are always there. Um, now, how could we visually um, represent this concept um, and to make it sort of attractive and interesting um, and sort of, you know, at the end, diver, diver worthy. Um, well, we concentrated our, our work, as you might have seen already, on Mornay's chest under that beard. We've concentrated our designs on two of, I think, every diver's favorite animal, um, the frogfish and the octopus. Now, we all understand as divers um, that when we're underwater, these animals are fantastic 
to not only photograph and, and, and you know, view, but they are extremely difficult to find due to their, you know, their mastery in camouflage. So graphically speaking, when we took these animals, um, what we wanted to do graphically, how could we sort of represent them in a graphic in a simpler way? Um, very simply, we got into our sort of diving gear, let's say, on our diving hats, or thinking hats, um, and we kind of tried to simulate what would happen while you're underwater. So, you know, as from a diver, from a dive master instructor perspective, or just a recreational diver, um, you know that as you're in the water, you don't really see them from far away, but slowly, 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 as you approach the animal or what you think could be that animal, you start seeing a shape appear. And it's not really only till you start getting very, very close to the animal where you will eventually see the animal in pretty much its absolute, you know, it's all, it's all its beauty and its magnificence, and you will be able to see it hopefully move. Um, and this is pretty much our representation of this sort of camouflage into the, you know, onto a t-shirt. Um, quick little mock-ups for now. Um, you will see the live product, obviously, a little bit later. Um, this is basically some of the results, all right, for different colors. Um, basically comparing, all right? And basically, this is our result from, you know, from, from zero to, to hero of how we basically uh, came up with an idea, investigated and, and came up with the, the final designs. Um, again, pretty much guys, uh, if, if anybody needs to sort of, you know, uh, follow up on us or needs to have, uh, ask any questions, uh, we got our contact details here. Um, feel, to, feel free to follow us, um, Facebook, on Instagram, uh, send us an email. We're always happy to sort of, you know, brainstorm and have a chat. Um, but apart from that, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the designs. Um, and I'll leave it up to you again, Mornay, for uh, I think you have a wonderful surprise. Yes, indeed. So, um, Miguel, thank you for that wonderful represent or, uh, presentation there. It was great to see um, how you got to these designs, and I hope that uh, the divers are going to enjoy it. So, from my side, Absolutely. while you were busy there, I um, entered all the names uh, that uh, registered via Zoom, and I came up with, uh, you know, four uh, names, and uh, I'm going to read them out now. I'll be in touch with you folks tomorrow. So, the two uh, ladies that won, the one is Carla Waddle, and the other is Gillian Brink. So I'll be in touch with you tomorrow and uh, we can talk about uh, colors and so forth and sizes. And then from the men's side, I've got uh, Dion Lopesha and Morvan McLean. So I'll be in touch with everybody tomorrow. Well done. You are the lucky draw prize winners. I hope you're going to enjoy the t-shirts and for the rest, um, they'll be available via the dance shop, uh, you know, in a couple of days time. So if you want to go check them out, the different colors, you're more than welcome to do that. But uh, also over the next couple of weeks, we got a whole bunch of uh, social media campaigns running to just push those. Now, um, just back to, to the main uh, speakers, Brett and Nessa. Thank you once again. I haven't seen any additional questions come in. Brett, I don't know if you saw anything while uh, Miguel was busy, uh, but it just I see a lot of uh, Sumari from start and she says another very, very interesting webinar. Sounds like an awesome app. Very, very well uh, presented by a very knowledgeable presenter. Well done and thanks a stack. So uh, Nessa and Brett, hats off to you folks. Uh, well done on that. And really, I mean, Wow, I learned a lot. Uh, I thought I knew the app, but uh, there's some things um, that I'd like to engage with, uh, with Brett and Nessa and Cleve and so forth to see how maybe we can start working a bit closer and, uh, you know, assisting divers and so forth. Um, so from our side, uh, thanks very much. I don't know, uh, Brett and Nessa, any sort of closing um, thoughts or, or words from your side before we wrap it up for the evening? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Monet, and thanks for everyone for the opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, please be safe this season. Have a whole lot of fun. Um, and yeah, have a, have a great season. Yeah, okay. Um, Nessa, from your side? Oh, hang on, Nessa. We can't hear you. You uh, muted. 
yeah there we uh, go uh yeah no look likewise um thanks for thanks for having me on um i hope i was able to to kind of um give a kind of clearer um picture of what safe tracks is and how it works um i'm going to follow up with uh, two things one is uh, a troubleshooting a gps troubleshooting pdf um that i can send on to you more name maybe okay um and the second thing is just to follow up as well on the request just on the the use of or the the consumption of data with yourself breast so i can i can provide a more detailed answer for that so so if there's a, a location where you, you can post that maybe Mornay on, on maybe the Facebook Live um, post or wherever, um, that would be good just to maybe share as well. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you share that with me, Anissa, just uh, to let you know, roughly tomorrow about four or five o'clock South African time, uh, the automatic um, uh, sort of follow-up mail with all the resources and links and the replay link will go out to the folks that registered. I then add all that information via YouTube channel as well as our Facebook feed. So no pressure. If you can get it before then, no, no worries. Otherwise, yeah. I can <laughs> add it afterwards as well. So no, that'd be great. No yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely get it to you before then. That's no problem. Okay. Well, from uh, um, Miguel, from your side, any parting words? Hey, thanks a lot, Mornay. Thanks a lot, uh, Ness and Brett, for the chat. It's been great. Uh, hope yeah. you guys enjoyed it as well. And I, I certainly did, and I did learn a lot as well. So awesome. Thank you. All right. So from my side, guys, especially the folks from South Africa, um, festive season's coming up. Uh, we still got, you know, uh, a lot of uh, COVID protocols we need to consider. But I'm sure, you know, uh, water sports is, is such a, uh, a part of South African culture, be that inland along the coast. And, um, you know, just from my side, without a service like the NSRI, we would struggle to, to assist people. So please support them. Um, they've got uh, various ways of doing that. Um, you can become a member, you can donate from corporates, they've got a whole bunch of things. Um, and I'll also make those links available so that if you are keen to support them, please do that. And especially now over the, uh, the festive season, their services and volunteers, and quite a few of their volunteers are actually uh, assist us via our day and dive emergency hotline as well. So you can see how nicely we, we work together. From our side, as I said earlier, we'll uh, make the webinar uh, replay link available. It's going to be on YouTube. It'll already be on Facebook. And then I'll add all these links in. Um, and from a Dan perspective, I'll also add um, the Dan Smart Guide to Travel, especially for the divers. Um, that's quite a nice thing with the, the, the upcoming festive season and holiday season just around the corner. Uh, besides that, um, you know, there'll be the usual kind of resources, uh, the alert diver, the annual dive reports, access to the dive safety portal that's got roughly about eight hours of dive safety lectures and so much more available. And for the folks that are Dan members, thank you so much for your support. Uh, it's through your uh, membership fees that we can host initiatives like this, keep the hotline running and all the other things that we do. And for those that aren't Dan members, great if you can join and support us, especially if you're divers uh, from a Southern Africa's perspective. All the details you can find on our website, which is danesa.org. If you're based in the Europe uh, uh, area, you can go to daneurope.org. And if you're in the US, Canada, South America, North America type area, you can go to Dan America's site, which is Dan. Uh, .org. Um, and if you're in outlying areas or different areas such as Australia, New Zealand, Korea, all those places, that falls under the Dan World section. Um, and uh, you can also find that, I think it's just danworld.org. Uh, if you do struggle, uh, you know, just give me a shot, but I'll add those links in uh, to the, the follow-up mail as well. From my side, thank you for everybody, uh, guest speakers, our special guest, um, Miguel, and all the folks that um, attended this evening. Uh, have a good, uh, a, a good rest of your evening uh, until next week when we have our last webinar with Dr. Franz Cronier. Thanks so much and good night.